It's a Nairi curse. Hi everybody, I'm Nairi, I'm a GP by background, and I'm here to give you a bit of health context. So I'm learning a lot more today than I've learned for a long time, um, and I'm kind of looking forward to the rest of the day. So I'm very grateful for my new position as a Joyce Cook Chair, which is a philanthropic post which lets me focus mostly on issues to do with ageing and do a bit less university service. Okay, so life expectancy, I guess we all know this, life expectancy has increased by 10 years since uh, 1950 up until 2012-2014. Uh, what I want to point out here is this disparity between life expectancy for Māori men and women and life expectancy for non-Māori men and women, mostly Pākehā. Beginning here, we started to count for Pacific peoples. And here is a fixed disparity here. We were making great strides until the 1990s in uh, reducing this deficit and now I guess you guys might have some opinions about this. We now have a fixed deficit where Māori are failing to close this gap, or actually the system is failing to allow Māori to close this gap. Okay, so um, why do we spend 42% of our dollar, health dollars on old people? Because they need it. And so different ways of measuring that need. Here we talk about the healthy life. So this is Australian data. New Zealand data is quite similar. At, at 50, uh, sorry, I think it's right, at 60, uh, yes, uh, health expectancy at age 65. So at age 65, you expect to live on average, this is a median of 284. Now, funny thing about median, that's halfway. So that means the other half of the population carries on after that, and you'll be interested to know that when you reach age 100 today, you've still got another, on average, two years to go. So nobody's going to die tomorrow. These are our, our median expectancies. So we have 30, you've got 3.7 years here for men living with severe disability. 5.8 years of this uh, additional uh, 12 years living with significant disability for women. So this is what's important. And I think if we can make some inroads into levels of disability, and the ability for people to be independent, we will spend less money. The government is worried about the cost of this disability. Okay, so these are our New Zealand population projections. And you can see here the band of people who are age 14, the band of 15 to 64, the band of people 64 to 85. And I'm very interested in this band, 85 and over. So I've drawn some lines here. 2016, 83,000 people who are age 85 plus. By 2038, 214,000. And by 2063, we seem to be very interested in 2060, 384,000. So that's going from 83,000 to 383,000. In a short period of time, I probably won't be around in 2060. Some of you in the room will. But I'm really looking forward to how it looks with that huge number of people who are over 85. When I was young, we used to nudge each other in the, in the, in the shop when we saw someone who was over age 90, and now they're everywhere. If interesting to you, there's 10,000 people in New Zealand over age 90 who still have their driver's license. Look out for good. The other important thing is it's not all happening the same for all New Zealanders. And it's very important to realise, look at fertility for Māori. This is the population pyramid. This is the proportion of people in those age groups for Māori on this side and non-Māori on this side. So here's our baby boomer bulge, which is marching through. This was at um, uh, 2015. So the steepness of this curve here means that, yes, there's far fewer people in the 85-plus group who are Māori, but the rapidity of change in the Māori population will happen much faster than non-Māori. And I've got a few, uh, a bit of data about that. And that's what this lovely slide shows. These are numbers here, 520,000 New Zealand Europeans to 780,000. Yes, quite a big number increase. But the proportional increase for Pacific people, for Māori people and for Asians going through in the older older age groups from 2011 to 2010 6 is huge. Yes, it's relatively small numbers, but the rapidity of change. And I don't think we as a society really understand the implications of this for, um, for how we're going to manage um, going forward, and particularly how Asian populations are going to manage, how Māori populations will manage. 
Okay, so this is some data from the Lilith Project. Lilith's New Zealand recruited 500 people aged exactly 85 and 400 Māori aged 80 to 90 in the, but throughout the Bay of Plenty in 2010 and followed them through. So this is just telling you the picture of the 80 plus year olds of New Zealand. And this is how they live, men and women, Māori here, and non-Māori men and women here. And this is those who are living alone. So you can see that women live alone, 65% of non-Māori women at age 85 live alone. And that speaks to independence. They actually are managing to live alone, mostly in the community. Yes, they are supported. Men somehow manage to stay married. <laughs> Less of them alone and they stay married. They don't stay married. When they're widowed, they marry again. Um, and that's very clever of them because it's much more comfortable to be in a married situation. But women make other choices. Uh, and then the other interesting thing here is that for Māori, they're much more likely to be living with others. Now, this with others situation includes about 7% who are in residential aged care and the rest of them living intergenerationally. So what does it mean to be living intergenerationally? And what we found was that the levels of disability were roughly the same between the two samples. So this is a way of categorising disability called intervals of care need. It's completely independent, not receiving any support or care. Those who have a long interval need something once a week. This might be home help, this might be gardening assistance. This is the smaller group who have short interval care need something every day that they need. And then the critical is several times a day, the people who need assistance to get out of bed, the people who need assistance to feed themselves. These are people in general that would be thought to be at hospital level of care in residential care. So now when we look at that, this is a little bit, the, the darker colours are those with critical level needs. So these are the people who, who are at in effect, nursing home level, and this is where they are living. So residential aged care or receiving support services. So for Māori, thinking about those people with critical and short interval needs, less than 50% of them are actually in residential care. For non-Māori over here, 70 to 80% are in residential aged care. So when you think about those with short and long interval needs, support, oh, uh, this slide, those receiving support services, it is relatively reassuring that people who are at that critical level need more than 60% of them are receiving um, support services. But I think it's really important to think about how life might be for those people who are actually living um, with critical, very high level needs uh, in the community. Are they well enough supported without rejection? So we took that same categorisation of independent, short, long and critical level needs and we mapped it on to the New Zealand population at 2010 and projected it through to the 2016. You can see this is 75% increase in everything. So that sounds manageable. I think we can manage that. People will help each other. But when you look at it for Māori, we have a much faster level increase in the proportion of the population in those levels of need. So I think that's important to think about. Will Will we stay the same? Will we get more healthy? Will we be less disabled? This is one of the things that everybody wants to know the answer to. Okay, so this is my spaghetti diagram, I love it. Uh, a little bit complicated. So this is the level of function. So very high functioning people have very little assistance needed. Medium level functioning and low level functioning have more uh, need for assistance. And what we've done here is map through what happened over five years, four, four, one, two, three years here. So there they are at age 85, 86, 87, 88, etc. The, the size of these lines is proportional to the, of the, to the people who stayed in the same category or changed. And yes, these lines were for people who deteriorated are fatter than the lines of people who don't deteriorate. Well, actually, most people stay the same. There are some people who improve. And I think this is news to all health providers. Everybody thinks, oh, 85, that's the end of it, you're all downhill. Well, it isn't. There's a, there's a lot of uh, switching around here that we need to appreciate. When you summarise that into those who stay the same or improve, you can see that of this population, yes, it's, uh, it's mostly community growing, but more than half stay the same or improve. And in this, analysis, uh, non-Mauri men did the worst, actually. 
So staying the same or improved can be thought of as being, you know, the norm, which is good. You have to think about the proportion who do deteriorate, but it's not all the, uh, it's not all bad news. Women did worse than men in Māori did, uh, I'm sorry, women did better than men in this, and Māori did better than non Māori. Okay, so receiving support services, this is another thing that state pays for. So this is state-funded um, support services. When you look at this over time, so we've got wave one, two, three, four, that percent over those three years follow-up. You can see that receiving support services stays relatively steady. This is a surprise. I thought everybody would get more support services. You've got to understand during this time period, most DHBs were having pretty significant revisions in their, in their uh, ways they provide support. The informal support is what was increasing. So this is informal, unpaid care given by daughters, sons, nieces, nephews, mostly daughters actually. So we know that actually the community has the ability to support its older people and over time they do it more and more. So um, more women and more Māori receive informal care. So what does that mean for our population projection? So there's actually got to be some people who are daughters and sons, and we've already heard about fertility and how that's happening. So a very famous person called Robin discovered or, or formulated this support ratio, which is simply the proportion of the population aged 50 to 74 to the proportion over age 85. So in 2016, that support ratio was 15 to one. That seems quite doable, right? So let's see what happens by 2033, 8 to 1, 9 to 1, and by 2060, 5 to 1. Now let's just think about that again. Who was it that was providing that income to support a good woman? So it's actually going to be down to 2.4 to 1. So that I think we need to think about. And I don't think we need to think about how we can incentivise, if you like, those people to keep doing what they're doing. What are our employment situations like? How can people continue to be involved in the in the support informal and informal of their of their older people? We also asked the caregivers of the of the Lilac study how much care they were giving and how much time it took. And so here we've got the hours of care per week, and they were given to Maori women, Maori men, non Maori women, non Maori men, and this is by their informal carers, so those who are engaged in caring. 30 hours almost to Māori men. Now, older Māori women came up to me after I present this and they said, well, you know about our men, don't you? <laughs> uh, and I said, well, actually, I think these are really important because if that is the amount of care that they are receiving, then that is the amount of care that potentially the community will need to continue to offer. When we looked at the costing of that care, so this is 25,000, this is per person in the study per year. Um, that is being contributed by family members. So, who's paying for that? Uh, I'm just asking you, you're the financial people. Uh, okay, so the alternative, residential aged care, let's talk a little bit about this. I love nursing homes and I love people with dementia, but not everybody does. I can tell you that there are very good stories about people who are in residential care. So let's look at the residential care. This is the proportion of the population in residential care. We're very fortunate to have had serial surveys, 1988, 1998, and 2008, of all of the facilities in the greater Auckland region. So that goes right out to Helensville and down to Cook Cove and um, up past Orima. So you've got 35% of those who are aged 85. So this is, you can see that Residential aged care caters mainly for people in advanced age. When you look at the proportion of those who are, so this is, this is 1988, 1998, 2008, you can see there's a huge reduction in the proportion of people cared for in residential care at age 85. And that is for two reasons. Those who are 85 now are in a higher functional level and are managing better than in 1988 and there are fewer beds. So there's a supply and demand thing going on here too. How do I know there's fewer beds? Because they counted those as well in these surveys. So these are, I want to be clear, the publicly funded, uh, subsidised rest home and hospital level care beds. And so here you've got rest home beds, 
and hospital level beds over that time period uh, over this in this greater Auckland region. This is occupied beds per thousand people. Okay, so think about that. That's a rate occupied beds per thousand people aged 85 plus. So there's fewer occupied beds, there's fewer beds, but it's interesting that the high level care beds are needed. Those beds, that, that level of disability is very difficult to care for in the community. During this time period also, we had the positive aging strategy, we had aging in place, um, we had strong incentives to keep people out of residential care, and theoretically we had an increase in the support services that were available in the community to support people, but this is what happened. Um, quite marked, and I think everybody would say this is a good thing, but be careful. We think that this has now reached a neighbour and that it can't go down any further, and we may need to see an increase in the number of beds at the high care levels that are needed. Now this next slide just shows, shows the level of dependency in care. So the people in the beds, so this is high dependency in the red, this is low dependency and rightly so at the private hospital level, so this is hospital level care, nursing homes, most people have high levels of dependency and that has been consistent throughout this 20 year period. When we look at the rest home dependency levels you can see below the high dependency people living in low dependency care have increased a lot and this is an issue because the rest home industry is really having trouble at the moment. So we think, have to think about this and how we manage to support those with very high levels of disability. Dementia. Um, Susan asked me to speak about dementia a little bit. Epidemiology New Zealand, these are projections. So this is the European and this is the number, the thousands of people with dementia. European, probably at the top. Uh, Asian and Pacific in the blue. So you can see a high projection, that is because largely the number, absolute numbers of people in the age groups that have dementia will increase. This slide is some real data from uh, South, South Auckland and it just shows you that this disparity I'm worried about with Māori and Pacific people potentially may develop dementia at an earlier age. We know that Māori and Pacific people have significant um, differences in the risk factors leading to dementia, cardiovascular disease, like education, um, and um, to some degree disparities in income. And so this is an issue, that dementia <coughs> may be worse. Okay, so will we be more healthy? Is this, it's not really a catastrophe, it's kind of understanding what the health needs are. There has definitely been a 30% reduction in the prevalence of dementia. Very careful study done called CFAS, where in 1988 they went through seven areas in Britain and did a very uh, careful population uh, sampling and ascertained whether people had dementia or not. In 8.8% um, in 1988 had dementia. They did the same thing 20 years later and found that 6.8% had dementia. That's a 30% reduction. That's really, really, really good news. So we're less likely now, you and I, to have dementia when we're old than we were if we were around 20 years ago. When you map that onto our numbers, if you look at the 65 plus, 8.8% .8 in 2016, now is 65,000. So 6.8, with that 30% reduction, it's still an increase in the number of people with dementia, potentially not as much as we may have thought. Severe disability, some other work by um, actually Lynn Cook and uh, Andrew Spohr and others show that potentially severe, damage, severe disability may ameliorate a little bit. We will still have significant numbers of people with moderate disability. How those people with moderate disability are enabled is the question that we have to ask. And the absolute numbers of people with 85, at age 85 plus with disability will increase, no matter how much of a reduction the absolute numbers of the increase to 2060 is an issue. Most nations are now investing in prevention in midlife to a large degree, and I think potentially, thank you, time's up. Okay, one last slide. This is just to show you the disability threshold we're all trying to avoid. As individuals age, they may reach this threshold sooner or later. 
There's lots of things we can do here to realize this long longevity dividend to stop people from reaching it. And then these people are actually contributing a lot to society as they are. Okay, acknowledge the people in who did lilacs, the funders of lilacs, the uh, Kaitiaki group who oversaw lilacs. This is a fantastic group of older Māori from around New Zealand. Three of them are gone now, and we uh, honour and respect them. And that's my contact details. Thank you.